Yeah, can go back. I don't think she heard it. She go back. Okay. Uh, maybe the mic was not working. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, I have great pleasure in introducing our first speaker, Dr. Magdalena Vazlova Kata. She's an associate professor and Canada Research Chair in Medical Physics of, uh, in the Department of Physics and Astronomy in University of Victoria, Canada. Uh, she received her PhD degree at McGill University and postdoctoral training at Stanford University. Her current research interests include Monte Carlo simulation, small animal radiotherapy, and flash radiotherapy. And she's deputy editor of the prestigious Medical Physics Journal. Her talk is Flash Radiotherapy Physics. Thank you for, uh, for, for presenting, and please go ahead, uh, Dr. Magdalena. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, and thanks for the, to the organizer for inviting me to speak at this meeting about flash radiation therapy physics. And uh, good morning, all. It's very early morning for 45 a.m. for me here. So first of all, uh, I would like to present my disclaimer. I'm cautiously optimistic about flash radiation therapy, and I hold Canadian funding to work on flash. So how is radiation therapy delivered today? It is delivered in fractions. Uh, a typical fractionation scheme is two grade grade per fraction, and that's done to avoid normal tissue toxicity. It's usually delivered with six to 10 MB photon beams, and the beams are modulated by means of a multi-leaf collimator. As a result, if we are waiting for the entire gantry to rotate, each fraction takes about one to two minutes to deliver. Now, in flash radiation therapy, what we are trying to do is to irradiate the targets with a prescribed dose at ultra high dose rate, either in a single fraction or hyperfractionated. And of course, this poses some issues. Uh, for example, from imaging standpoint, if you're trying to irradiate, say, a lung tumor that's moving, you have to be really careful about imaging. So in this case, we very quickly miss the target, and now we very quickly hit the target. So imaging will be a crucial part of flash radiation therapy when uh, applied in the clinic to deep-seated tumors. Now, a very brief overview why we are talking about flash radiation therapy. While ultra-high dose rates studies date back to 1950s or 60s, um, they were done with uh, in vitro irradiations. It wasn't until 2014 when Fabodon et al. presented a study in which they compared normal tissue toxicity and tumor control for mice irradiated at conventional dose rate and flash dose rate of about 40 gray per second. These irradiations were done with 4.5 to 6 MV electron beams using a high out output Linux. So let's look at uh, tumor control for this particular example. This is a uh, relative tumor volume as a function of uh, days after treatment. And let's focus on this blue curve. That's a 19 and a half gray conventional irradiation and 20 gray flash irradiation shown in purple. And you can see that for these two similar doses, the tumor control was very similar. Of course, that by itself is not very important. And what the authors did, they also looked at normal tissue toxicity in a number of examples. But let's just focus at um, radiation-induced lung fibrosis, 36 weeks post-irradiation of uh, mice. And here, let's focus on the second column that where it shows the level of lung fibrosis um, observed 17, after 17 gray flash irradiation, and the last column that shows 17 gray conventional irradiation. And you can see that about less than 30% of animals showed any radiation-induced lung fibrosis for flash irradiation, and all animals in the conventional irradiated group uh, showed radiation-induced lung fibrosis. So that clearly demonstrated the reduced normal tissue toxicity after flash irradiation for the same tumor control. And if you are still not convinced, this is a photograph of a mouse whose abdomen, uh, sorry, whose um, thorax was irradiating to 20 gray of flash and you see clearly hair depigmentation in the thorax area, but you see no epilation or skin ulceration, which was the case for conventionally irradiated mice. Now, there are many other studies uh, in small animals and uh, in, uh, in, in larger animals as well, in cat patients. Uh, and finally, in 2019, Professor Jean Bouchis presented uh, at the first patient that was treated uh, with FLASH. It was a patient with CD30 plus T cell cutaneous lymphoma, 
And I will not go into too much detail because I'm sure that Dr. Jean Borges will be presenting this at the end of today's session. Uh, but I just want to demonstrate uh, this three and a half centimeter lesion that was treated with flash to 15 gray in 90 millisecond. And uh, in figure B, you can see the um, lesion at three weeks at the peak of skin reaction. And at the bottom, you see the lesion at five months post irradiation that, of course, responded very well. So, up to now, flash has mostly been shown with electron beams. And uh, for example, there is a number of machines. Um, the first one um, would be the Oriatron and Kinetron machines that deliver four and a half to six MeV beams. And those were the original machines that the flash effect was uh, observed on. Um, and uh, this, these machines can deliver dose rates of about 500 gray per second. The Stanford group modified their own LINAC and they were able to basically get into the guts of the gantry uh, of the head of the LINAC and were able to get 74 gray per second. And just last year, the Dartmouth group presenting 10, presented 10 MEV beam uh, that they were able to uh, get up to 240 gray per second at the isocenter with much larger beams. And they achieved that by running the LINAC in the photon mon mode, but removing the photon target. I will not go too much into details about the, the system because uh, Dr. Marco Durante will cover that after my talk. Now, uh, this inspired a number of companies to look at uh, commercial uh, electron sources or pre-commercial electron sources. I'll just mention three of them here. The first one is the intraop Mobitron uh, beam, and uh, we'll hear about that uh, from Dr. Francois de Blois uh, later in the session today. And there are two more uh, machines, the PMB Alsen flash knife, as well as the SIT Sortina Lyac flash machine. They all are great machines because you can purchase them and you can run either experiments on them um, or maybe even treat patients experimentally in clinical trials. However, these all de deliver energies of electrons of about 10 MeV or lower, which definitely limits the depth of tissue penetration to about five centimeters. So how do we treat patients uh, with flash radiation therapy at ultra high dose rate deep in tissue? Well, one of the uh, answers offers itself and that would be proton beams. So even prior flash radiation therapy, we knew that in pencil beam, proton dose rates exceeded 200 gray per second. And I'm sure now manufacturers try hard to get even higher dose rate. And indeed, uh, the group at the University of Pennsylvania has demonstrated the flash effect yeah, after abdominal irradiations of mice, and they used a doubly scattered uh, IBA beam. Now, this inspired uh, Varian, and uh, they started a flash forward consortium, and the first clinical trial on flash radiation therapy at the University of Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Here, they are using 250 MeV protons to irradiate uh, patients to eight gray in single fractions uh, at a dose rate of 56 gray per second. And the cohort of patients are patients with painful bone metastases. They have accrued all their patients, and we are eagerly awaiting to see the results of their clinical trial. Now, we have talked about electrons and protons, so why are we not using x-rays for flash radiation therapy? Well, let's just think about how x-rays are being generated in a LINAC. So we have a, a, an electron beam that impinges on a tungsten target, and through Bremsch trial, we are uh, achieving x-rays that we can treat patients with. Unfortunately, this uh, dose from electron beam to dose from X-rays is not a very efficient process. And look, let's look at it why. So first of all, if you look at this uh, stopping power for tungsten and 10 MeV electrons, we'll find out that at this 10 MeV energy, the radiative stopping power equals collisional stopping power. And that basically means that only 50% of the electron beam energy now goes to, into X-rays. Now. Unfortunately, even though these X-rays are forward directed, not all of them are directed towards the target. And uh, we lose some of the energy of the electron beam uh, here. And finally, it turns out that the dose per particle for electrons is about 20 times higher than dose per particle from photons. So all in all, uh, we get about one to 5% efficiency in converting electron beam dose to photon beam dose or X-ray beam dose. You could also think that, well, we can just increase the electron beam current and we get a higher uh, X-ray dose as well. However, we'll run into issues in which we are delivering too much heat into the target 
and the target could potentially melt. But there still has been efforts to figure out how we can deliver flash radiation therapy with X-rays. And that brings me to some of the research that our group is doing here at Triumph. And here we are using the 10 MeV electron beam at the aerial beam line. And we are using the electron beam dump that we are converting into a photon uh, radiation station with flash. So what we had to do, we had to design a target that would not melt. And we chose to uh, pick um, uh, tantalum as the target. So we are the explosion bonded one millimeter of tantalum onto an aluminum flange that is actively cooled with water. You can see the target design on top, as well as uh, Monte Carlo simulations to assess what type of dose rates we would expect from our machine. We also ran thermomechanical simulations to figure out the um, heat dissipation as well as mechanical stresses on the targets. And we were able to estimate that the dose rates that we should be getting should be higher than 50 gray per second at a depth of about five centimeters in tissue. And this is the actual photograph from our experiment. And I'm very happy to finally state that we are commissioning as we speak, or rather we will be in a few hours when uh, 7 a.m. here in, uh, in Canada. Now, uh, we are not the first ones to be looking at high energy X-ray uh, flash radiation therapy. A group in Chengdu was using their superconducting LINAC at the Parter facility, and they used a 6 to 8 MeV beam to impinge on a rotating tungsten target. In this way, they can hit, dissipate the heat much easier than we can, and they were able to achieve dose rates of about 1,000 gray per second and uh, dose rates of greater than 50 gray per second at 15 centimeters step over several centimeters square. And so this study was just published in Radiotherapy and Oncology last month, and uh, these authors were able to observe the flash effect also with uh, high energy X-rays, which is uh, very exciting and probably possible to translate to, to patient treatments for deep-seated tumors. Now, it was not the only time X-rays were used uh, to um, show the flash effect. Um, we, um, uh, uh, Dr. Pierre Monte-Coel, who will be presenting in this session today as well, uh, used a synchrotron beam to show that the flash effect was still present for mice irradiated, for brains of mice irradiated to 10 gray uh, with flash and compared them conventional irradiation therapy. Uh, the only issue with the synchrotron beam is that it is very focused and uh, it basically delivers beams of 50 micrometers in size, slits of beams. These uh, thin beams have ultra high dose rate of 16 kilogram per second. However, in order to irradiate the entire um, brain of an animal, the animal had to be translated through the beam, which resulted in the mean dose rate of 37 gray per second. Regardless, the flash effect was observe observed at the ESR in Grenoble. Uh, conversely, uh, researchers at the um, Australian synchrotron also ran uh, studies that they called ultra high dose rate studies and they were using dose rates of 37 to uh, 41 gray per second and irradiated the abdomen and uh, used total body irradiations to look at the difference between conventional and ultra high dose rate radiation therapy so let's look at uh, these ultra high dose rates um, probability of toxicity curves uh, as well as uh, conventional radiation therapy and you can see that, if anything, there is very little difference uh, in the probability of toxicity. And perhaps these ultra high dose rates del delivered uh, or resulted in higher uh, probability of toxicity for this abdominal irradiation, not so much for TBI. But we also need to know that, uh, from our understanding, uh, it is that 37 to 41 gray per second, where the instantaneous dose rate and mean dose rates were much lower than that. Now, we have talked about uh, high energy X rays perhaps possible to deliver electron beams that cannot treat deep CD targets. Uh, low energy X-rays from synchrotrons cannot treat deep CD targets either, uh, but proton beams can. At this point, I'd like to talk about one more uh, type of particles, and this is very high energy electrons. It turns out that if we uh, increase the energy of the electrons to about 100 MeV, we, have some, we get some uh, interesting uh, percentage depth dose curves that might make very high energy electrons uh, good candidates for clinical translation of uh, flash radiation therapy. So there are some advantages to very high energy electrons, such as the uh, they can deliver ultra high dose rates because they deliver a high dose per particle and there's no conversion target needed, such as it's the case for photon therapy. 
very high energy electrons are relatively insensitive to tissue heterogeneities, especially when compared to protons. And since they are light charged particles, they are easier to steer than, than protons. Uh, now that brings me to a study that I performed uh, at Stanford uh, with uh, Bill Lu. And uh, this is the uh, basically design of the original phaser machine in which we considered a completely uh, scanned electromagnetically steered electron beam uh, and its delivery to, to patients. Uh, so this would be enabled by a highly efficient pi mode standing wave accelerator structures developed by Dr. Sami Tantawi at SLAC. And uh, it would uh, start with a 100 MeV LINAC that would be electromagnetically, the beam would be electromagnetically, electromagnetically steered towards the a number of nozzles that then, then they would also contain a, a number of uh, electromagnetic steering um, sections that would enable pencil beam scanning, such as shown here on the left. We have developed uh, a Monte Carlo dose calculation engine and coupled it with a ray station to create a treatment planning system for very high energy electrons. So this is just a comparison for this uh, pediatric patient case with a small uh, brain tumor of about 4.3 cubic centimeters. But you can see that the very high energy electrons are actually delivered more conformal doses uh, compared to the VMAT plan that this patient was treated with. And in some cases, the doses to critical structures were uh, about 30% lower when irradiated with uh, very high energy electrons compared to VMAT. But what was interesting when we are looking at this, and it was really the goal to decrease the treatment time, is that we calculated back then that it would take about one second to deliver the entire fraction of 36.2 gray to this target. Of course, this is below the threshold, but uh, this is also not with optimizing the, the, the electron beam. And for me, it was uh, very exciting to see that the University Hospital in Lausanne started a collaboration with CERN to build a very high energy electron treatment machine to deliver flash radiation therapy. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, flash beam parameters. Uh, depending on what kind of machine we are looking at, uh, the beams can look you know, in different ways in terms of their uh, temporal structure. But uh, for example, if you're looking at Linux, each macro pulse that's about uh, a number of microseconds long con uh, consists of a number of micro pulses. And there's about uh, a number of uh, milliseconds that are in between these pulses. We really don't know what is an important factor for the flash effect, and I'm going to make some uh, propositions at the end of my talk. However, uh, we know that if you are delivering a very high dose per pulse, some of the equipment that we are currently using for dosimetry is no longer um, feasible to use. And some of these equipment are, for example, ionization chambers. They might not be this, the best for ultra-high dose rate deliveries because they suffer from significant ion recombination effects at these ultra-high dose rate. And there was a very nice study by Peterson et al. Uh, that have looked at uh, the ion recollection efficiency as a function of dose per pulse. They uh, use one of these uh, Riotron machines, they use 6 MeV, and we're able to demonstrate that while the, when the dose per pulse is uh, less than 0.1 gray per second, uh, 0.1 gray, uh, then we get almost 100% collection efficiency. However, when we get to dose rates, per, dose per pulse, doses per pulse of about 10 gray, the collection efficiency decreases significantly to less than 30%. And that makes ionization chamber, this is the advanced ionis Marcus ionization chamber, makes them not very feasible to use in flash irradiations or ultra high dose rate irradiations. So in one of the studies by uh, Dr. Pierre Montegruel, they have looked at um, the dose response of uh, dose rate response of four dosimeters, ionization chamber, film, TLD, and alanine. And they have uh, irradiated them to 10 gray with varying dose rates ranging from 0.1 gray per second here at the bottom right to uh, 500 gray per second. They, and they have also delivered the entire 10 gray dose in 1.8 microseconds, which results in a dose rate of about 10 to the 6 gray per second. And you can see that while all these uh, detectors performed reasonably well, there are also large error bars, uh, which make them perhaps not very useful for uh, flash radiation therapy, at least uh, when we are looking at uh, patient treatments. And the other thing that I would like to point out that uh, apart from the ionization chambers, all the other dosimeters are not online dosimeters. They need readout after irradiation. So they would not be very useful for beam monitoring. So here I'm just showing a number of uh, typical dosimeters um, that we have uh, 
looked at in our review paper and as a function of uh, the ultra ultra intra pulse dose rate and when they were being shown to be dose rate independent in the different beams such as in electrons photons and proton beams so you can uh, look at these and see uh, what kind of uh, dosimeters we should be able to use for these different beams. Now, it is really interesting to see that there has been a lot of research done on the dosimetry of ultra-high dose rate beams. So what should the appropriate flash dosimeter look like or beam, uh, beam monitoring system look like? It certainly should be dose rate independent. It should provide online readout with high temporal resolution, but we don't really know what is the best temporal resolution. Of course, uh, femtoseconds would be great, but we would probably end up with a lot of data and might not be very feasible. So here I'm going to just show uh, three different types of sort of novel detectors or beam monitoring systems that people have been working on. So just, just last, last month, uh, the Lausanne group uh, presented some data from Beam Current Transformer in which they're looking at the um, relationship between the dose that was delivered and the charge. Uh, collected by this beam current transformer for different uh, types of ultra high dose rate irradiations as well as conventional irradiation and you see a nice linear relationship for all the different parameter studies um, then the dartmouth group looked at um, a turing off signal collected by a photomultiplier tube and they were able to find out or observe that the first few pulses of a uh, variant linac deliver lower doses and uh in our group, we are looking at uh, plastic scintillators. Um, we are looking at just uh, how our plastic scintillators respond in our small X-ray tube system with a, with a shutter system. So this is what you see over here. Uh, note that these first two uh, types of uh, detectors have a very high temporal resolution of uh, two to eight nanoseconds, but our plastic scintillators only have two millisecond resolution at this point. So here I'm just going to summarize a number two, of two minutes to go. Thank okay, you. summarize the some of the ultra high dose rate delivery systems. So what you can see here is it's the instantaneous dose rate um, on the y axis and mean dose rate on the x axis. So all um, continuous or quasi continuous beams will be laying on this uh, dash, 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 dash dotted line. So here we see a number of electron sources. Uh, so uh, in this uh, cluster, we have the electron variant Linux as well as the kinetron and oritron machines and other experimental machines. Here are some of the photon sources, uh, the two synchrotron beam lights as well as an X-ray tube. And uh, we'll also see a number of proton beams um, uh, in green over here. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to show a flash sign at the machines that were that demonstrated the flash effect. So you can see them over here. And while a number of researchers think that the dose per pulse is the important parameter to achieve the flash effect, I would argue that since we have seen the flash effect for quasi-continuous beams, such as the proton beams and the uh, X-ray beam from the synchrotron, perhaps the dose per pulse is not the most important aspect for flash radiation there. Now I'm just going to summarize uh, what we know and what we don't know uh, in terms of physics of flash. We know that the flash effect was shown for electrons, photons, and protons. That protons uh, and very energy electrons might be a good candidate for a clinical translation of flash radiation therapy to deep-seated tumors. Real-time dosimetry might be challenging, but possible, and we can think about Cherenkov detectors or calorimeters, apart from the ones that I have already discussed. What we don't know is how to treat deep-seated targets how to treat, treat large tumors, or if even these large tumors would see the flash effects, what are the delivery parameters that matter for, to achieve the flash effect. Does multi-beam delivery result in the flash effect? I don't think there have been any studies to look, looking at multiple beams. And if so, how to plan for this and how to image ultra fast? We haven't really answered any of these uh, questions, but we have certainly been working on that. So in conclusion, we do have more questions than answers, but in physics, we are making great strides to um, provide these answers. And that's thanks to many groups that are working on, uh, on ultra high dose rate radiation therapy. A number of expert groups have been also formed, such as the UHD PALS, AAPM, ISTRO, EFOM task groups, the NRG and the NIH and CI are working on that. I do believe that it should be implemented in the clinic very carefully because we only get one try and I would like to conclude my talk by saying that faster is not always better. So with this, I would like to acknowledge my group, uh, my collaborators and sources of funding. And I would like to thank you for your attention.